Hello and welcome to The Magic of Podcast with Paul Rothman. So today I am elated, uh, I think is a word to use. <laughs> I, I was going to use happy, I'm elated. It's my friend, uh, my friend who is a polymath. He is many things. He is a magician, he's an actor, he's a producer, he's a writer, he's a creator. He's a teacher. Jolly annoying, all the things he does. Um, he is the wonderful uh, Mr. Steve Valentine. Hello. Hello. Hello, dear boy. How are you? Good. <laughs> there we Two are. Two English accents and neither of us are in England. What's that about? <laughs> well, you know, we've got to bring a bit of culture to uh, this crazy part of the world. Actually, you're not even... Well, yes. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So is that a tea or coffee there, or water? I'm afraid it's coffee, mate. It's the other brown, brown yeah, liquid. Me too. Uh, yeah. I, I was going to have tea, but tea lately has been tasting a bit um, a bit like brown dish water. What's that, that, that show that's on Apple right now? It's really wonderful uh, the, the, about the, the American coach who goes to oh, England. Oh, Ted, Ted Laszlo. Yeah, Ted Lasso. It's so, so much fun. And one of the things, the kind of the ongoing gag is how tea is disgusting. It's kind of the ongoing gag. And I love tea, but lately it's just not been hitting me right. And I wonder if it's the psychology of that show. I wonder if that show is single-handedly going to do for tea what Sideways did for the Merlot business. But we'll see, you know. It's true. I didn't drink, I wouldn't drink Merlot for ages. And, uh, mm. and, then, I, and then I'd have it and I'd still, I didn't like it. And eventually I had a good one and I was like, all right, that, that's part of it. I actually went on a... I know this is a, a sideways thing, but um, I went on a wine trip once. I had a business manager for a while, and he had a bunch of clients, and he, he put put this uh, trip together for a bunch of his clients. And it was really an eclectic group of people. There were um, uh, there was a movie director, the guy who did the movie Twenty One. Uh, there was uh, a bunch of other people, and and Alexander Payne, who I got to know a little bit, who wrote Sideways. You know? Oh right, and. We were, we, so we flew in this little plane over to Napa. It was really quite lovely. I was so happy to be invited. And we went to all these wineries. And the one consistent thing was everyone knew who Alexander was. And <laughs> so many people said, you know, that movie single-handedly destroyed our Merlot business. Because of that movie, we now have more Cabernet or we now grow different grapes. And it was, it was an interesting, I mean, they were nice to him, but it was, you could tell that it had a massive impact. There's that scene where he's just like, Mello, I don't drink fucking Mello. And um, yeah, that it's just, this goes to show you the power of culture, right? The power of media, that it can have that kind of a, that one scene can affect an entire business. It's Yeah, that it, it was really significant. It's funny that that, and it, it's funny how these things, you know, there's the, um, the collective consciousness yeah. that, that applies to so many things that, you know. It's well, to even, an audience as well. I mean, just doing a you're doing a live show, the audience becomes a collective consciousness, doesn't it? And you can, you that's why you can bomb in front of an entire audience. I mean, it's still an audience, and everyone's got their different senses of humors. But if the if the vibe that goes, well, look for example, you work the Magic Castle, right? Uh-huh. You know, when I, in the '90s, it used to be Monday, Sunday was a very tired day. There was a the building was tired. There was a tired energy at the end of the week, and anyone who came into the castle as an audience member, felt that. Monday was always a bit rough. Tuesday was kind of excitable. By the time you got to Wednesday and Thursday, the energy was rocking. By the time you got to Friday, Friday was your big night. That was just, and it infected everybody who came into the building. And the building had this collective consciousness energy that used to wash over people. And there was no, you know, and then if it was a night when every, every audience was bad, because it just people, there was a cranky energy. It was, it was a fascinating thing to to experience you know same with that i was just watching have you been watching the crown at all i haven't Being- i haven't i'm, I'm <gasps> <laughs> i you know, uh, oh, i don't i hear it's amazing but it looks a little mm. bit soapy it's not it's not it isn't it isn't okay i would no it's re- really good the acting is fantastic so if you just look at it from the the production value the writing um the cinematography, the directing, and the acting is all top notch. 
And uh, the story is, I think they try to get as accurate as possible. But they also, they try to put a human face to get you to understand what it's like to be on that side of the wall, you know. Um, and uh, right now there's this whole stuff with, with Diana that's just kind of resur- you know, resurfaced from the documentaries to what they're doing on the crown. Uh-huh. One of the things that's interesting is when you, when you look at it and you see how many people in the crowd had Diana's haircut. Oh, yeah. <laughs> back in the 80s like you realize that that again collective consciousness just like people emulate people take in that vibe or whatever's you know it was the same with jennifer aniston Gen- in the, i was in the about 90s. to say yeah yeah and, so and funnily enough it's the same with magic yeah you know there really is a collective consciousness of of magic or the influences the significant cultural influences in magic that push it one way or another yeah you can read the old magazines and you can read how every, every every single decade, like if you read the Magic Wand, which goes for like, it's a magazine that goes for 45 years, 1901 to about 1945, I think. So two world wars and a Russian revolution. And uh, you go through the blitz, you go through everything with the editor of the magazine and you go through the politics of what's going on in Europe. And it's all there as well as the magic and how magic changes. But the constant is always that the magicians aren't doing enough to be original. So-and-so ripped me off. Um, please stop doing American patter from American patter books. This was, there's one article where this guy is just this plea to British magicians to stop doing Robert Auburn patter. You know, no one knows what a dime is in London, <laughs> right? Um, and there's this kind of, uh, this thing that everyone was saying that they just missed the golden age of magic, right? So everyone claimed that the golden age of magic had happened, and that now is not good. And Di Vernon, even in one of his interviews in the Revelations DVDs, talks about how he never said he was a magician. That's how he came up with the term New York card expert. Because as soon as he said magician, it had a connotation to it that was negative. And so, uh, but now, and, and I wholeheartedly put that in the hands of David Blaine from his initial street magic special. He changed the face of magic on top. I mean, I think Copperfield was of his time. Copperfield is amazing. And uh, 80s, 90s, uh, early 2000s, uh, he he is Copperfield. He is the big spectacular imagery of magic. And then, da- and I remember pitching magic shows in the 90s, and everyone's like, "You can't do close-up magic on television," you know. Um, but David found a way to make that. Wo- David Blaine found a way to make that work. And so that cool factor, which was brought in by David and um, let's face it, Leonardo, Leonardo. DiCaprio, who introduced David Blaine's first TV special, by having Leonardo introduced it, Leonardo essentially introduced close-up magic to his fan base. And that gave it a cool factor. And then Neil Patrick Harris becoming president of the Magic Castle, that gave it a cool factor. And so we've had J.J. Abrams talking about magic and mystery at a TED Talk or just the fact that he loves magic. All these people have kind of, uh, this, these acceptances um, have, yeah, changed the consciousness of magic. You and I know what it's like to work working men's clubs and cabarets where you walk in where nobody particularly wants to see you. Everybody was hoping for the hypnotist. Uh, you got a bloody magician. <laughs> Fuck, not another one. And you're fighting to get their attention and get a reaction out of them. And now people, the new generation, have been primed to react almost too much in the other way with the screaming and the running out of the room and the, and the freaking out. Um, and so it's, it's lovely, but it spoils the, I think the younger the generation now is who hasn't experienced how hard it was to go on the stage and say Vegas at the improv and try and, you know, for an audience of 200 people who have just lost everything at the blackjack tables, try and get them to laugh and enjoy magic. So you ha- now we have an audience, we we're spoiled, right? We have these audiences who love magic, who um, are when you say I'm a magician, they go, that's cool, man. Show me. That's, that's all. You know, people are really into it. And it's hard for me to change when I say magician, you know, I, it's really hard for the old habits of kind of massaging that title. Right. You know, it's hard for me not to do that. But so right now, yes, I think we are in the golden age of magic more than any other time. It's accepted. It's loved. Um, people really, really dig it. 
But I, I tell you, I just read an article, I think it was a 1920s uh, issue of Magic Wand. And there's a, a guy who does the Scottish column. And he just reports about uh, the, the state of magic in Glasgow, Edinburgh, whatever. And he's talking about Edinburgh and he goes, it's been a, he says, it's been a uh, slow week for magic in, in Scotland. We only have uh, Lafayette at this one theater, Chung Ling Su at this other theater, and, you know, and, and uh, Horace Golden at this other theater. I mean, that's a slow week. That's a slow <laughs> week. You've got three amazing. So it's, you know, point of view, perspective. and I don't think magicians, magicians could get, I mean, you know, I don't know. You were here, you were here, I say here, in, in Los Angeles in the 80s. Yeah. Um, well, late 80s, 89, I, I first came over. So 80s, and so but significantly yeah. early 90s then. Is that your yeah. stomping yeah. ground time? Yes, I would say 89. We came over in August of 89. So um, are, are you, are, are, it, where is the fashionability of magic at that point? Um. Almost nobody wants it on television. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the only te- the only magicians on TV at that point was was David Copperfield doing a special once a week. The idea of a weekly show was something that the executives couldn't get their heads around. Um, fashionability of magic. You really that it really wasn't fashionable. You would just show up at a bar mitzvah. You would get hired for bar mitzvahs, for uh, birthday parties, for corporate events, for magic grams. There was a point where magic grams, which I, I did one, and I was like, never again. Um, <laughs> There, I was lucky because I, I moved, had, by accident moved right next to the Magic Castle. And so I was able to become a member and hone set, you know, work, work shows there for seven nights, as you know, 21, 24 shows in a week. But I also, because I was so close to the castle, I lived half a block away. Um, I managed to get a deal going with one of the hosts at the time, EJ. He was a great guy. And uh, on a Friday and Saturday, if they got too busy, he'd call me and I'd run up and do what we called overflow shows. And we started this thing called overflow, which now is, you know, the shows happen. Now it's very organized and it happens in the dungeon and everyone gets their turn. Yeah. But back then, no, it, the, the castle was a different place. And so I would just, sometimes I do six shows in a night, you know, and I got paid 40 bucks for the night. But my God, I gave out, people would ask for my business card and I would give it to them if they asked for it. And um, (laughs) because that's the rule. You can't just, you know, I I remember the first time I had this lovely business card production where all these blank cards become printed and they kind of end up on the table in a design. Uh, I got into so much shit for that. So, um, but uh, that was that. So the fashionability of the castle has always been cool. It had always been the holiday. And that was because of, people like uh, you know Cary Grant who would be at the bar when you walked in I mean it was that I remember Buddy Ebsen used to come up all the time so there was that fashionability uh, but then I what was fashionable in the 90s were Beverly Hills house parties so I was able to kind of segue into doing that and that was eye-opening to there's wealth and then there's wealth Right, you know, there's a big house, and then there's uh, Marvin <laughs> Davis's palatial estate, for example. Uh-huh. I mean, just as like royalty, and those were those were the fashionable times. And I would turn up and do a little bit of close up, and then a close up show, uh, more of a parlory close up show um, for people, you know, like Lawrence Kasdan and and uh, uh, Ray Stark, and all these kind of like big Hollywood names at the time. That's, I mean, that's a really, that's an interesting thing. So I, I mean, I first properly met you when I saw your show, your um, uh, stage show. You saw the, f- you saw the forty-five minute, minute version. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it went from two hours, two and a half hours to ninety minutes at Black Rabbit Rose, and then forty-five minutes at the car, at the castle. Yeah. yeah, and and I, you know, I, I came up to you at that point, and went right. That's it. That's exactly right. You, got that's right. That's what it should be. That's that's the thing. That I'm looking for that that makes sense, and um, and so what I mean by that was, uh, and we touched on it just before we we started, but just the, the narrative, um, authenticity, which is something that always comes yeah. up, 
uh, uh, self-awareness, know thyself, who, who, what you're talking about, and building from your experiences. Yes. A- and um, and yeah. the magic kicks ass. I mean, so that for me, that, that's like the baseline. The magic has to be great. Yeah. That, that goes without saying. We need to get away from the idea of the comedy magician where the trick's okay and there's a couple of jokes and we've got to, we've got to get away from that. That's just... Yeah, and sometimes it doesn't that, do any, that's, anyone any good. No, and sometimes that's misconstrued when I say you know it's it, it it's about you and you know I I I take it as a given that the magic has to be great you know really good. Unfortunately, um, most people don't. No, they don't. a lot of magicians don't <laughs> take that as a given. So you're going to have weak tricks, even if you pack it with uh, gags. It's still not. Like, if you're going to be a magician, be a magician. You know, I just heard a talk, an old 2016, I think it was, or 13, I'm not sure. Um, Richard McDougall at EMC, when they, everyone was getting up and doing their 15-minute talks. Mm-hmm. So I just saw the Richard McDougall one, and it was fucking brilliant. And it was exactly that topic. It was, what is, every art form has moved forward. I mean, look at pop music and see how that's moved forward. Look at, look at, any kind of art television. I mean, where we, where we are now with the Netflix kind of programming versus what was allowed five years ago, mini series or limited series. They don't want to call them mini series anymore. Um, Cause that's got a dirty connotation, but uh, there's uh, when I say that, I, because I knew a guy who was the king of the mini series. And when mini series became uncool in the mid to late nineties, it was very difficult for him to find a new kind of uh, producing job because he was known as the king of the miniseries. The miniseries were looked down upon at that point. Now, of course, everyone loves these limited series because you get huge names for short periods of time and you can create incredible quality content. It's amazing how things change. Um, but anyway, I forget. Oh, Richard. So Richard talks about, uh, and it's a, great talk, it's a great talk to go watch. Like, what's your point of view? What is it you want to share with an audience? Whether you're working at Wheel Tappers and Shunters, you know, <laughs> a, a Ford working men's club, or, um, you know, what, you know and, and he says part of the problem is your audience might not want to see what you have to share. For example, I couldn't do my one-man show at a working men's club. No one's going to give a shit about the narrative side of things. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But the truth is you don't know until you give it a shot. Yeah. Um, and as long as it's relatable, I, mean, you, I remember you and I having a long conversation that night about relatability when it comes to storytelling and magic, where it's not just, you're not just telling a story at people. You're, you're um, creating uh, something, a rapport with the story. Um, but so Richard, anyway, Richard talks about this and he says, there's a, uh, there's a quote. And this is what sta- the one thing really stayed with me about his talk was he said, Richard Abaddon, the famous photographer, got his first magazine job. And as he was leaving the office, the editor turned to him and said, astonish me. <laughs> and I think those two words, like every time you look in the mirror, every time you write a new routine, every time you practice and look at your magic and film it, if you say, is that astonishing me? And not just from the magic, am I astonished from the personality, the presentation, the comedy, everything has to be next level. And, you know, the danger, of course, is buying a trick with patter and just doing it word for word, which is what most, I don't say most, a lot, a lot of magicians do. But astonish me. Those two words, if you just keep saying that to yourself on every time that you do write a new piece or you look at your act, like, is it astonishing? Is your performance astonishing? I think that's... Uh, Two of the most powerful words you can feed yourself. I think, uh, where is it here? One of my, one of my, three of my most important books uh, that are there somewhere, which are The Art of Astonishment. Yes, uh, second shelf up on the far right hand side. <laughs> I recognize the covers. Uh, second shelf up, all right. There we are. Yeah, boom. Yeah. So these little fellas. Yeah. Are absolutely wonderful. Look, at, look how many bookmarks you have in that thing. <laughs> See, if I was visiting you right now, I would, when you were in the bathroom, I would take all the bookmarks out and put them in different places just to fuck with you. Yeah. And also to make you look at new material. It's, yeah, it's true. It's, it's great. That was, you know, back in the day when I was looking for specific things. And 
uh, but they're great. Actually, it's great to go back and find bookmarked um, books. Yeah, because you go, oh, what, what, what was that about? Oh, I never did. What I must have. There must have been a reason. And there's there's a really. I'll just pop this on the floor. There's a really lovely um, thing that I found with magic as well. Is when I go back to the beginning of my magic journey, yeah. and I look at the tricks that I either bought or thought were great, yeah, which I've put aside. And then I think, why did I put those aside? And it's because maybe they were relatively easy to do at that time, or I thought they were, or they weren't impactful enough, or I moved on to the next thing. But what's interesting is, before you're the fully-fledged magician and you're impacted by, by magic effects, there's a reason you're impacted by those magic effects. It's, yeah. it's less the, the conscious kind of, I'm a magician looking at, for magic it's more i'm the lay person looking at magic and being affected yes. by them and richard talks about that in his talk he talks a lot about looking at magic from not from a perspective of methodology like look at your act say what would i want to see in my show if I, if I was watching me walk on stage what magic would appeal to me and i think i do that when i'm writing too is, is quite often i have a breakdown of what i think a script or a story is going to be but you have to ask your character, what do you want to do next? You know, is, am I forcing you into a round hole here? Am I, are you a square peg in a round hole? It really feels like my character wants to go out that door. And that's sometimes you have to ask yourself that too. Is that the same uh, for you as, so in your show, for example, Yeah. yes, it's you, but he's become a version of you, I would say. Oh, absolutely. There's, and the stories are all, you know, somebody was giving me shit about getting my dates a little bit mixed up. Someone who know me for a long time. And they said, I don't remember you doing that that year. And I was like, look, it's a narrative. Okay. Like in any story, it's, it's, it's uh, hugely based on reality, but you've got, you can't tell a story and then just, you can't have the correct, entirely correct linear. It just isn't good dramatically. You yeah. have to massage it a little bit, but, Essentially, it's all there. Um, so what, the hardest thing for me was, it was Chris Philpott who said to me, you know, you should do a one-man show. You're an actor. It makes total sense. This was around about 2014. He would said that to me, maybe end of 2013. And it took him forever. And then he ended up writing an example for me of a, um, some stuff. And he was like, here's kind of how I see it would be. And I was like, and that inspired me to go off and write my script. But I, I remember we did a, uh, a Kickstarter to raise money, which is very difficult for a live thing to raise money. So it's easy to raise, easier to raise money for a product. When was this? Uh, 2015, 2014, 2015. Oh, okay. okay. And, and uh, so we did the Kickstarter and I remember thinking, well, I'll write the full, I wrote the treatment so I knew what the show was going to be about. And I thought, I'll write the script if I get the money. I'm not thinking I was going to get the money. And then I got the money. And then I was like, Shit, now I've got to write the script. And the hardest part, uh, if you're writing a script with, for you as a narrator of your life, is who are you? What's your story? You, so, I'm like, what is my voice? You know, the first draft came out a bit angry and bitter. And I was like, well, that, that's no good. I mean, it's true, but it's no good. But it was, it was very difficult to find the rhythm of who I was as a performer. Uh, and then... Um, I wasn't sure if I was anywhere close to nailing it. And I remember sending it to a friend of mine, to Andrew Hill Newman, who's an amazing magician and actor and writer, and, um, and uh, Chipper, Chipper Lowell. And Andrew's response was, when he read the full script, which was about three and a half hours long before like the big edits, uh, I, I was taking, I was being pretty vicious in the narrative like saying things that magicians have never said in a one-man show and talking about things that we've never really talked about and being honest about what it's like to be a live performer in such as of an audience what's that such as so this is like what it's like to be in an audience who do magic for an audience that doesn't give a shit that you're standing in front of them you know to talk about there are people who say you should never make an audience feel bad about being an audience 
But I'm like, no, I want people to know what it means when you put all this, you have a love of your craft and you go to do a magic show and people roll their eyes and turn, shake their heads and turn around and turn their backs on you or deliver or knock cards out of your hand or treat you like a piece of shit. And it's like, what does that do to your soul as an artist, as a performer? Now we all have to make a living, you know, that, so you balance the idea of, uh, the money's good versus, you know, so for every $10,000 you make, you know, do you lose a little bit of your soul? Right. right. But this is the balance that as an artist that you have, uh, Edgar Allan Poe never made any money and while he was alive. He was, in his mind, a failure. He never got paid properly for half the shit he wrote. He died in the streets of Paris. It's like, it wasn't, so, so artists are used, we're used to artists having to go through this shit. And for, so for me, that was part of it. It was like what it was like to be a magician. And what, for me, my narrative and my story was what it was like to be a magician performing for celebrities when all I wanted to be was the celebrity when I wanted to be the actor and I've got these guys you know and I've got I'm thinking casting directors I get to know some casting directors or I got to know casting directors and I remember being invited to a party once and then one of them going Steve (laughs) do a trick for my friend and I was like fucking snap your fingers at me that that made my heart sink you know I had all a lot of those those things. So there's this thing about being a performer and you'll talk, when you talk to professionals, as you know, professional magicians, there comes a point where it becomes a business and you can tend to lose the love. And that's a very important line in the show and was really how I cracked the, getting the rapport with the audience, which we talked about way back was you have to ask your audience if they've ever felt this way. And what I discovered in the first, just the first couple of live performances was that that the audience responded viscerally, like actually were going, yeah, you could hear them go, yes. Or you'd hear the gasps or you'd hear the moments. You just, you just, people were there with you. I I had a, my story was a Hollywood story being about being a magician and an actor, but the, everyone in the audience by putting it on them and saying, have you ever felt like you've loved something, but you've done it so much that you start to hate it? And everyone's like, yeah, you know, have you ever wanted to be one thing more than anything in your entire life, but everyone is against you doing it and everyone shakes and wants you to do something else? Yes. I had a casting director who came to see my one man show. Who's, who's a huge movie casting director. And she said to me, she had tears in her eyes at the end of the show. And she goes, you know, I can't, they won't let me cast television because I'm a movie casting director, you know? And so we all know what it feels like. Um, one guy wanted to be a pianist, a grand pianist, but his parents wanted him to be a doctor. So he's an emergency room doctor, but, you know, he's not happy. So we all know what it's like to be dismissed, to be ignored, uh, to be um, not taken seriously. And I think a lot of for me growing up, a lot of that was the British sensibility towards anyone who wants to rise above their station. It's like, who are we? We're a very classist system, obviously. Brings us right back to the crown. But, <laughs> you know, I remember telling people I was going to be an actor and them said, who do you think you are? Tom Cruise. <laughs> who do you think you are is actually a great title for a biography because you'd hear that a lot. I want to be a magician. Who do you think you are? Paul Daniels. You know, <laughs> and that's what you face Anytime you want to step outside of your little cubby hole where everyone's comfortable for you to be in. Well, that's, that's a really integral point that, that's come round again is this idea of where we talked about Copperfield or Blaine or the reinvention of magic. I mean, Blaine just reinvented what already existed. Yeah. And it, it wasn't new. It was just the flipping of the perspective that was new or right. hadn't been seen for a while, or we use the medium to reinvent the old stuff. And um, this idea that you can't do something, or everybody's jumping on board, it's happening now. Yeah, We've talked about this, this the Zoom shows and the right. Instagram magicians. And, right. and, and there's nothing wrong with it because these things have to reinvent. And there, there, there is nothing wrong with it. And I think, just to interrupt you for a second... Yeah. Um, I feel like we are, there are magicians who are against change. And I think that that's, 
why the art form is lagging. And you can see that in the old magazines too. You know, people, you have to dress a certain way. One of the things they did with my show was to put real language in it. Cussing. Um, I probably overdid it in the early drafts of the show. But the reason being is people would say, oh, it's been bad language and that ruins the show. It's a magic show. It's like, don't tell me what a magic show should be. I'll, I'll do my own magic show, thank you. And I would have explicit language on the poster so there was no excuse um, for people, you know, not to... Be, but I remember thinking, like, that, that is... There you are, right there. That is a reason why magic lags, you know, because you're telling me what it should be instead of letting me do my version of it. And yet the same person who says to you, you shouldn't be cussing during a magic trick. And maybe there's a psychological reason for that. Maybe because magic relates to wonder and it relates to a, a side of you that's an almost childish side as an audience member. And so the language contradicts and conflicts with that. And that's a possibility. But those same people will go and watch, say, Dave Chappelle or, you know, some, or, or Eddie Murphy tapes or whatever and, and listen to just the foulest language um, and love every minute of it. You know, so it's what's expected within the genre. So you have to fight that always. The, the the word that most people, if you're doing a good job, will respond to your magic with is fuck. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Yeah, your audience is usually worse, uh, you know. Yeah. The language from your audience can be uh, uh, way more worse than what you will do. But you know? we're, and, and, we're, and, we're different, though, as well, because we've got the British thing in America. Yes which is a different thing. It, it, it's yeah, definitely, it's great. it's great. And it also means, I mean, I know, and I'm very aware of my language. I'm very aware. Yeah. And I can be pretty foul mouthed, but I know, I know what I'm, it's not without intention. You know, I know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And um, well, I think it's different if you're doing a, a house party. Yeah. Versus a one man show, theatrical narrative thing. That's, you know, if you watch Darren Brown, very <laughs> carefully, in every live um, theatre show, there'll be a couple of moments where he'll say fuck or shit, but it's at the right moment and it has the right impact because it's incongruous to the situation and because it's not expected to be coming out of his mouth. And so it has power, you know, and that's, uh, and I've used that. I, I think in the later versions of the one man show, I cut the cussing down way uh, a lot and uh, I, I use the power of fuck or shit um, so that it had more resonance in the moment you know um, yeah but it's uh, it's so, so it's so what we expect of a magician is what's been holding magicians back I just did a thing for magic on the go which is my online site as you know um, I do these podcast kind of audio narrated things uh, called past masters. I do one called armchair stories where I sit in an armchair, very much like Ronnie Corbett used to in the, in the two Ronnies. And I'll talk about a topic of magic, whether it's uh, Carl Hertz and the vanishing bird cage or the Paul Rossini and the effect he had on performers, or in this particular case in the audio podcast, past masters was an article written by Oswald Williams back in 1921 something like that about called what's wrong with magic and i read this and i perform it like i'm oswald williams not with the voice or anything but i perform the words and it was 100 percent as relevant today as it was when it was written 100 years ago and that's terrifying you know none of that should be relevant but it is i think so i think that's just relative to everything actually you know there's nothing new under the sun um yeah you yeah. i mean you're a great proponent of finding um old manuscripts old ideas seeing how they fit into today we've discussed mm. in fact you performed uh you know not so long ago you were doing a big stage show um, yeah. um which the illusionists. was delusionists and yeah. you were touring all, all over the place and was, that was a fascinating experience yeah and you it was something that you you had to think about doing i think like, yes, because we. It's so funny. I'm looking at you, and right above your head is my C, my C two P. Did you put that on purpose? I don't that, know. Just <laughs> I was riffling through some things, and I keep uh, looking at my <laughs> at myself um, photoshopped in the background. Um, uh, my cards to pocket on the bus. 
That's uh, up there. That's the. Uh, that's up there. That's everyone, what that everyone is. Everyone should get that. In fact, you don't seven. need to. You should get on Magic on the Go. That's it's where, all on Magic on the Go now. There's like 120 it's... videos on there, and those are all up, up, uploaded. Um, so yeah. So my issue with the Illusionist was not the quality of the show, the production value, and everything about it is top notch. Um, my issue originally why I didn't want to do the Illusionist was it's seven or eight magicians, nameless, faceless magicians. We all have character names. Um, so, you know, we spend our entire life trying to rise out of the noise and have a persona and stand out and above. And you work hard on your career and you kind of get yourself credits and you kind of want people to know who you are. But the illusionist is not about that. The illusionist sells on the overall concept and promise of what people are going to see. So, and the reason, I think one of the reasons they also do character names, which is brilliant, is because you, they then create a show that is a format that you can slot magicians into and therefore it's scalable. So I um, was able to spend some time with Simon Painter, who is, you know, in charge of the company created the thing um, with a few other people. And, excuse me, he explained to me um, the thought, the reasoning behind the illusionist. It's not important who you are that much is, you know, cause I'm like, but you know, I want to be this and I want this to be said on the introduction and I want to use. And in the end that wasn't important. It, what was important was scalability um, that they could use almost the same poster design that uh, you people going to the illusionist knew what they were going to get, even if it was a different magician in each slot uh, that every routine had to be under eight minutes. They really, ideally, five and six minutes was really difficult, and I was very guilty at not, not being able to do that. Um, and but f- for reasons like, uh, anytime you do audience participation, you don't know what's going to happen, and when someone says something, you can't ignore it and get on with your act. You have to deal with that, and that sometimes can create new laughs, and then that creates longer sets. Um, but um, so, yeah, so he explained to me the, the, the brilliance of the marketing idea behind it. And it is a brilliant concept. And um, so I'd never done a national tour. I've done it in theater, but I've never done it in a variety show. And it's a huge crew, trucks of equipment, um, all these different theaters for like three or four months, different audiences across America, North America. And I thought this, and in the end, I was like, look, uh, we, we talked about it. And um, I thought I'd give it, a, I'd just give it a show. It was kind of one of those, I need to see what this is like. I, I want to be on a stage in front of 5,000 people and see how my stuff plays. And the fact is they have cameras and screens. In the end, I was doing almost close-up. The second half, I was doing almost entirely close-up with two people on stage, just like, say, Knight Leipzig or uh, Billy O'Connor, uh, two people in a table, uh, but I had a camera and a screen, and I played the whole thing to the camera and the screen. And it was so much fun to do this, the routines that I'm used to doing in the close-up room for 30 people and feeling that humor and that magic work to an even larger volume of, of audience, you know? Um, I'm glad I did it. It was frustrating for me not presenting me, but um, there was also kind of fun in that kind of anonymity. What character were you? I was the showman. The showman. Yes. That's a good one. We all know what that means. Liberace, (laughs) darling. I was the showman. He's such a showman. He's such a showman. But that's wonderful. And, And that's something I've talked about. The difference, certainly coming from England, So I've come out to LA a lot later than you. I mean, I've been back and forth, but last year was my big year in terms of the real castle experience. And, and, uh, you know, it's something I come back to so much. And within the pandemic, we're all aware of, suddenly aware of what was actually valuable, uh, what was important and what what had impact. And performing in the Magic Castle in the close-up room, is a really, really in- interesting thing because in the British market, you don't do that. That is not close up. Right. It, and it's not really close. It's, it's parlor. It's yeah. just amplified or, or, or tightened or restricted, but it's still parlor. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, but you learn something very, very different in performing that. And so normal close-up in the UK would have been, right, you said drinks reception, round the tables at a, yeah. a do, a banquet, potentially a little show in the lounge. But it, it when you do it as a proper parlor show, yeah. you suddenly, you've got an audience, first of all, who want to see magic. You, um, so you spoil it right there. You spoil it right there. You don't have to get their attention at all. But then, yeah. but then again, then showmanship and the showman comes into play, and yeah. and that having had that experience where I've done gigs where you go up to someone and you go hi, <laughs> uh, hi, I'm the magician, and they go, can you just fuck off? Yeah. Um, no, seriously, I can you just fuck off? I'm with my mate here, and I fucking yeah. hate magic. So yes, piss off. All experience that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, um, very rarely, but it has happened. Um, but you don't, but also because of that, you have that, you know, that little zing inside you that you're ready for that, that difficult person. And I, you know, I remember in the close up room, some guy who heckled me at the beginning, standing yeah. on the side with a pint. And, you know, the wrong person to heckle. You had flashbacks <laughs> to uh, Vietnam, didn't you? And it was like, oh, incoming. But and, he, and then you react and you react too harshly. Well, and he, now the audience, especially in America, because it, <laughs> you, heckling, uh, uh, heckle lines, shall we say, for Americans' audiences are uh, very difficult. And British audiences, you know, uh, fuck, I mean, anything is possible. It's a game and it's part of the culture. And in America, you, somebody could say something really horrible to you. Uh, if you destroy them verbally... <laughs> You may win the battle, but you've lost the war with the audience because they're going to think that you didn't handle it with grace, even though they probably in the same situation would have punched the guy out. You, number of times, especially when, when I've been in that, cl- that close-up room, that room was, m- for the 90s, I used to call that my room. I fucking love that room. We used to, before the fire marshal got involved, fuck the fire marshal, before the fire marshal, we used to pack that room with 60 people. And you could, you could pack them all the way around the back. So it was just a living, breathing unit. And you could, I would go out there and do shows and people would pass out. It was so hot in there. And we would take them out to the bar, give them some water, go back in and continue on. Like people weren't put off with it. I had audiences that were so drunk. I had a, a, a audience of the whole, like half the audience were these Russians who had been, was so drunk and so loud, but they were having a good time. And that's, the difference is, they're shouting things out because they're enjoying the show. They're not putting you down. They're, uh, they're, they're uh, um, immersive and they're, 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 they just want to be part of it. And this is the new generation of audience that feels that they can have a conversation with you in the middle of your fucking act. And sometimes they do. And you just have to be able to handle that with grace and style and not um, – come back too harshly because the audience will hate you for it. Even if you win, they're, they're, you know they're, what I mean? they are the, the, the skills that you, you learn in that environment. And you know, that, that yeah. ability, there was, there was an act I saw years ago at the castle. He did a thing with a telephone and a poker thing and a, and it was okay, but right. someone heckled him and he did nothing. And what was annoying about it was it was the best heckle ever. It was a great line. And I was just, I sat there and went, oh my God, he's given you gold. You're going to come back and say, ah, and he didn't. And I just went, I hate you. I just, I, at that point, I hate you. Well, then you'd run, because what happens there is you've got, you're in the situation where you're a performer who's not listening to his audience and the audience will sense that and hate you for that. So the, the dip, I think what makes a good magician is someone who performs with their audience and not at their audience. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you can tell the guys who perform at their audience. They're the guys who do the same tricks, same way, no matter who's sitting in the audience. They look in the same place. One of the biggest, my biggest pet peeves is a, is a magician on stage who's looking above the heads of the audience. And especially in the Palace of Mystery, when they're, they're down, they're fucking down there. And you're going, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, who, who are you looking at? We're, we're, hello, we're over here. You You have to listen. And even if it's, even if it's a line that says, you know what, that's brilliant. That's going in my show next week. Thank you. Um, you can diffuse so many, by acknowledging that someone says something that's funnier than you, 
you know, giving people that moment in the spotlight. <laughs> that was, can I use that? I'm going to steal that. And now all you've done is uh, you've given him credit, but you've also regained control and you've done it in a gentlemanly fashion. Um, I remember having, I think I've talked about this before, but when I was on tour with the illusionists, we had, I did a chocolate box routine at the beginning of the show. And I had trouble with the idea of doing it that early in the show because it's really a patter routine that you do after an audience gets to know you. Once they know me and my personality and my rhythm, then I go into the chocolate box. Here I was opening with the chocolate box. So just explain what what that is. The chocolate box is a routine where... There's a lot of procedures. So basically, I come out, I come out very first of all, and I tell, I tell them that, um, uh, uh, I forget what the opening line was, but I open up the chocolate box, and I've got a chocolate box, and it's full of chocolates, and I'm throwing them out to the audience, and I'm like, here you go, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, blah, 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 I'm having a chocolate box. And then I hand the box to somebody in the audience, and I have them examine it. And I said, would you tell everyone it's a normal box? In fact, why don't you bring it up on stage, or get him up on stage. And now he's looked at the box, and then I have a coin, which I have him sign. There's a lot of business and gags and stuff that kind of covers this procedural uh, portion of the, of the show. He signs the coin. Then I go get someone else while he's signing the coin, and I get her up, and she's holding a glass. And I have a dollar bill. I borrow a dollar bill from her. It gets folded up. It gets put inside the glass, and she's holding the glass. So this is all procedure. My issue in my heart uh, when I was doing it so early in the show was there's a lot of procedure before we got to some magic, right? Um, coin vanishes from the box while he's holding it and appears inside the folded dollar bill while she's holding it in the, in the glass. And that's kind of the effect. And, and the longer version is it then goes from the dollar bill back to the box. And then the box fills up with chocolate a second time. And I give that to the lady to, to you know, take it back to the audience. So it's a signed object and possible location routine, but it was something that I wanted to do that no one does. And it's a trick from the 1920s that was described twice in magic books wrongly because the, the creator of it didn't want anyone doing it. <laughs> um, and so he published it in Will Goldston's and a few other places and just, you know, gave the wrong method. So, so but I tracked down the right method and then added to it. So um, my, you know, my, my biggest problem with that trick was making it work in a situation like the illusionists where I wasn't able to do my opening section, my opening routine. I had to go right into chocolate box. It worked but what was the lesson on that was it kind of worked in the format of the show. When I look at how Simon and everybody was looking at the show was the opening had already happened. We'd already appeared on stage. So the way that he does, the way that they look at the, the bigger picture, you know, and this is the importance we've talked about, about having a director for a show is they look at the overall arc of the first half, as opposed to me looking at the overall arc of my bit right? Um, but the audience had already been amazed with us all appearing on stage. So now it was okay to go into the patter routine. So, but my, uh, my uh, paranoia about just getting through it um, and getting the audience to know me uh, was something that was always kind of like in the pit of my stomach uh, when I would open with that routine. Now, now that routine went 10 minutes. The edited version, moving as fast as I could, went 10 minutes. If anything came, if there was heckles or if the people up on stage um, started adding, I, see, I don't call it heckles, really. I call it adding to the show, right? If you look at it like you're adding to the show, if I can have a human conversation with someone on stage that takes me out of my set patter, I think that's an amazing thing. And the audience senses it and the audience leans in because they want to see how you're going to handle it because they know they couldn't handle it. So what are you going to do? I had a guy in Washington, D.C. who was... Who was um, uh, Secret Service. He was on. Uh, he wasn't in. Uh, he was in regular clothes. Got him out from the audience. Got him up on stage, and I'm doing a, a thing with it where I have him sign. It's Keith Keith Field's great gag with a with a marker pen that keeps changing into a cane, and every time you hand the marker pen for them to sign something, you're Wah! and it just changes to a cane, right? And everyone jumps, and it's funny. And this guy, every time the cane happened, would almost punch me. He, he went. <laughs> He went right into position, like, because it was his training. And I'm like, you're highly, in my mind, I'm like, this guy's highly fucking trained. This is, I'm like, what are you, secret service? He goes, yeah. <laughs> so, and then every single time I did it, like, two more times. With, and I'm like, I am really going to take my life into my hands, <laughs> you know. And I, it was hilarious and terrifying all at the same time. 
And the woman I get up, who is, her name was Mrs. B, and I'll never forget, I love Mrs. B. She was an 80-year-old uh, woman in the front row, and I said, I need a lady. And she stood up and she said, I'm a lady. And, you know, that's normally you would say, absolutely not. <laughs> but I was, wasn't bored with the routine, but I, I needed shaking up. So I'm like, all right, coming up. And I, and I turned to the audience, and I think for me this was a lesson, because you're always learning, right? I said, I think I'm taking my life into my own hands here. What do you think? And everyone was like, yeah. And now they're on my side, right? So now whatever happens, we're in this journey together because I've got this cantankerous character on stage and I don't know what she's going to do. That gave me, us, the audience, permission to go off script and also enable me to Jack Benny half those moments, you know, just kind of, just kind of look at her, look at them. And they were with me the entire way. She was so lovely. She wouldn't stand still. It took her forever to get up on stage. And, you know, and I was doing a couple of lines about God, I hope she makes it <laughs> you know, just, just um, because a two hour show love, come on and uh, getting her up on stage. <clears throat> and then she just kept moving over and, so I, she's supposed to be on the stage right holding the glass with the dollar bill but she wanted to see what was going on so she just kind of would wander over and look over my shoulder and I, and I could sense her being there and I, and I was ah! you know just doing this <laughs> and mo- moving her back to stand over there and it got to be got to the point which was so much fun where I, I felt I could say get back over on your mark go no over, like a four year old go st- go on the other side and do as you're told Jesus you know and you can have fun with her but by incorporating the audience, by bringing them into it with me, as opposed to making it antagonistic, which it could so easily have been, you know, it could so easily have been like, she's trying to ruin the trick, but she wasn't consciously. I mean, it made the routine literally by the time Mrs. B got off stage, that routine went 22 minutes. <laughs> I was in a You must've been popular. Yeah. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't very popular. But um, that's really interesting. You know, that, yeah. that, that um, it's, it's, it, it's actually stagecraft. It's understanding impro- it's, it's being able to improvise within the, uh, well, you improvise in the moment, but it's, it's improvising between the lines as well. Um, yes. But I think the term improvising is a dangerous term. I think when we think improvisation, we think of a skill set. We think of training. We think of when well, reality, you're just living. Mm-hmm. In, in reality you're just living Be, being in the moment you're being in the moment you're just there and um living and quite often you'll get a laugh just by pointing out something that's going on by just addressing the reality of the situation you know i used to do later in the show the biggest laugh i ever got the entire tour um i was i used to go out at the end of the show near the end of the show I'd, and I had my whole card routine. At one point, I would bring an elf in for various reasons because it was Christmas shows. So I had this Christmas elf bit of business. And then later on, I would do the vanishing birdcage, but I would do it out in the audience. So you'd find me in the aisle, about halfway up one of the aisles, camera facing me so that if people looked at the screen, they, you could see the faces of the audience, right? Which is always fun because now it's me and the audience around me. Everyone loves to see themselves on camera. And by the way, the vanishing birdcage uh, is a beautiful trick but when you do it on a camera on a big screen, it looks like a camera trick. It, it just, it just lo- looks like it just vanishes. So I've got the cage and I've got the elf in the cage and I'm like, I caught this guy backstage, you know, and the camera comes in on the elf, which is great. So now you see this elf sitting in the cage. It's very subversive. And cause you got little kids there, you know, and I'm like, don't worry, I didn't touch him, but we need to send him back to the North pole so we can have a show next year. And so I do the vanish and goes great. I show the inside of my coat, nothing here, nothing here. It's gone. People are stunned. I, I, t- I turn around to show the back. And as I'm turning around, there's a woman on my, over my shoulder on my left-hand side, uh, older lady, um, slightly shaded glasses, sitting like this. Right? Just like that. Everyone around her is laughing and clapping. And she's like, bored, hates it, hates me, hates everything. I turn around, I see her face. I turn back to the camera and I'm like, I'm glad you all enjoyed that. Well, um, that's kind of well, you know, most of you. And she had no idea I was talking about her and she was still like, like this. And so I was just like this. And 
I was like, so anyway, I, uh, <laughs> and I started laughing, you know, and the audience could see her and know that I was referring to her. And they started laughing. And this went on for two minutes. It, I'm not kidding, Paul. It was one of those things where I couldn't bring myself together. I was like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, and those the rest of you are having a good time. Um, you know, <laughs> I started, and the crowd is, they're with me. And I could see the guys backstage kind of going, what, what's going on? What's, you know, what's, what's, why, why is everyone laughing? What's going on? What Steve is, uh, you could look at it as being somewhat unprofessional. At the same time, the audience was with me in a moment of life where you could, you could have turned around and said, did you like that trick? Fucking show it, you know, on your face or, you know, but instead it was, they knew, I, I can't even explain it at the moment. It was, you, you talk about a con, uh, like a communal consciousness I mean, everybody was with me on that moment about this woman giving me the filthiest looks, hating what I'm doing and giving me the greatest moment in the, in the show, you know, um, that's the beauty of life. That's, I can't wait to get out of this COVID shit so we can go back there. You have such a, you know, that's, it's something that's really inbuilt to your culture, uh, your cultural experience. You cannot yeah. get away from it because being again it comes back to the british thing of you know it it's weird and it's hard to it's something that you it's so integral you know we're brought up with a history of uh pantomime yeah which is different from the americans understanding of what pantomime they think pantomime yeah. is a uh, movement yeah. um but pantomime is a, a a traditional show and the dame and the the callback and the 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 the, the um uh, oh no you didn't oh yes I did yeah all that stuff that's inbuilt to you it's inbuilt the topical jokes the the I did I did a ton of panto back in my teens and early you know and so I was always admiring um Ale there was a guy called Alexander Bridge who had a theater company called the Proscenium Theater Company and so we would do throughout the year we did old-time musical which again there is all go. about the repartee musical. with the audience yes um and then at Christmas we would we'd do plays and musicals and at Christmas we would do we would do panto. And so, um, you know, part of that also part of panto is it's completely self-aware. You are completely aware that you're doing cheesy jokes or the audience is there with you. You're always breaking that fourth wall. You're always, uh, you know, and I think that's, uh, the fourth wall is what magicians need to think about when they're performing. It's like, I'm doing my show here. Uh huh. And, you know, there's a glass wall and literally people are on the other side, like you're in a goldfish bowl, but break that fourth wall, smash it open, talk to the person who's right there and, and connect with the audience. And yes, Panto was an amazing training ground for me. Um, I have this book uh, called by Michael Kilgariff mm -hmm. and it's about doing old time musical. And it's how to be the chairman, how to put an all-time musical show together. And it's the greatest, I'm looking for it because I had it out the other day. Um, but it talks about handling an audience, what to say in this kind of situation, how to get an audience to shut up and how to get an audience to take part. Uh, th those things were incredibly valuable. We, part of Panto is also trying to make the other person laugh on stage, you know, as we call it, corpsing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that technique of, I remember once the pant, I was playing Abanaza, of course, and the panto dame reached over, grabbed my beard and pulled it off and went, look, instant shave. <laughs> and, and, um, I, you know, you try not to laugh, but the audience, the, the f real corpsing where you really can try and make uh, uh, someone laugh keeps you absolutely aware on stage. And we have you that, get bored. we have that, you, get... you know, pulled it off. Uh, I'm just thinking innuendo immediately. Um, right. You know, that's my, br it's, I was watching some um, American uh, commercials and comedy stuff. And I was thinking, why is this not funny? Now that's not to say their stuff isn't funny. You know, there's brilliant, brilliant comedy, um, you know, Frasier yeah. and, you know, all that's wonderful stuff. But there is this so self-aware comedy that they do 
where it's it's almost like this meta comedy which i it, it just i find i just wrote a, a script called bad magic which is a pilot which of a single camera comedy and it's bawdy and it's fast and it's takes no prisoners and it was my attempt to not do comedy that's very that's very smug mm-hmm. and in love with itself that's it. i think a lot of comedies right now are very smug not just american comedies but there's a lot of comedies out there that are comedies that you maybe have one titter or two and it's kind of amusing i remember you know the days of a sitcom like frasier or or like the like where you would have massive laughs and so i saw john cleese talk about i think it was john cleese talk about this on graham norton i might be wrong but the difference between say British or European comedy versus American comedy is that American comedy is very gag based and British comedy is situational based. So take a, you know, if you look at uh, most American sitcoms, it's gag, 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 maybe leading up to a situation, but it's really, it's about the gag writers and a very thin story. Look at something like Only Fools and Horses. One of the funniest moments is the chandelier (laughs) bit, right? You know, and they build up to that. And there isn't a there isn't a gag. There's no punchline. He's like they're holding out the cloth under the chandelier, and Rodney's an idiot, and he cuts the the chain on the wrong chandelier, and it falls. That scene is so brilliant. That moment where that chandelier falls is perfect situational comedy, because you know the characters. It's character based, um, and you know it's why that British comedy works internationally because you're setting up friends was very good at that uh there was um because you knew the characters well my my favorite episode is when joey has an audition and but they need someone who's not circumcised (laughs) do you remember this at all uh and he's circumcised i forget the reasons why they but anyways he's got in, in the audition he has to drop his pants to prove he's not circumcised. So like all of us who will go to the nth degree to get a part sometimes, uh, he ends up, I think, taking some Play-Doh or silly putty <laughs> and massaging it around the, and the way they do it is great, massaging it onto him. And there's a scene at the end of the episode where they're behind him and you can see kind of, you, there's the three, the casting director, the producer, the director at the table, and he comes in and says hi. And you know we've been building up to this situation the entire time. And it's very similar to the chandelier moment in Only Fools and Horses in that the camera goes down as he drops his pants and you see them going like like this. And then suddenly <laughs> the piece falls off the, <laughs> off the end and hits the floor. Like this end of the, 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 the silly putty hits the floor and there's a clunk and a pregnant pause and you, you just see everyone's face it's the funniest thing that moment, you know, that to me, that's great comedy, Uh um, character driven comedy, because then it's timeless. Yeah. I've been watching, um, rewatching the black adders. And I mean, it's just, I mean, black adder for, especially for the American audience, I highly recommend it. They will love it. And I've, I've introduced it to some friends here. And what's really interesting about it, is the characters are well drawn they're totally real in their yeah. sensibilities they know who they are yeah they uh they're intellectual in the writing so there's there's layers upon layers upon layers of historic um cultural yeah. reference yeah there's old time musical stuff going on left right and center yeah slapstick slapstick all of it. um farce and then there's that kind of wonderful wordplay and insult and and they're not really caring that you know you can get away with it and pushing the boundary and and really listening and of course some of the greatest modern day actors are in it i mean you know hugh laurie's in it stephen fry's in it yeah rowan actors well, aid edmondson uh written, Fine, uh, written by ben edmondson, elton right written by ben elton and um um richard curtis and Richard Curtis, who I, who I love. It is Richard Curtis, uh, isn't it? I'm, uh, uh, do you know, when you talk about that, there was a, there's a show called Vicious, by the way. And have you seen it? Um, Vicious with um, Ian McKellen. No. It's a, it's a sitcom on, on, um, on Netflix, but it's fantastic. 
It's these these two old gay guys living together, oh, yes. and they just cut each other. They love each other, but the J- jokes, Jacoby, Terry you, Jacoby, and Dave yeah, Jacoby, and yeah, yeah. And Ian McKellen, and the writing on that is it's fantastic. I was just watching. This is what I mean by timeless comedy. Uh, Fry a bit of Fry and Laurie, <laughs> which was uh, you know Hugh Laurie. I mean, Americans are also surprised when they hear uh, you know Doctor House talking with an English accent. I did an episode of House and he talked with the American accent the whole time, even off camera. Oh, and really? It was really weird for me because I grew up with this guy, you know, doing English. But um, Bit of Fry and Laurie and the sketch is uh, Hugh Laurie walks into a privatised police station. Oh, yes, I know uh, that I think, one. That's brilliant. Yeah, people, this was, uh, I must have been the Maggie Thatcher time when everything was being privatised and... And so what would a privatized police force look like? And so relevant today, everyone's talking about, you know, dismantle the police, bring in something else, privatize it, let's make it, you know. But what would a privatized police force look like? It will be just like uh, privatized uh, medicine. And it will be a disaster, you know, depending on your how much you pay in taxes, how much you're worth, how much you're willing to pay for, you know, if you want an investigation, that's 1999. Uh, but with your insurance, you have insurance, you know, it was a genius sketch and again relevant today but superb writing um so with you as well i mean one of the things that comes out again it comes out in your show um and you talk about it is this battle this constant battle with being a magician and being an actor yeah and yeah this is a really relevant thing and this is something that you know uh we have a a similarity i suppose have you how do you feel about it because i know that you we had a conversation and I've talked to a number of people about this thing, about being in LA, you have to kind of decide who you are because that's how you need to present yourself to the powers that be. And even though in my mind today, you kind of expect it to do more than one thing, you still need to be taken seriously as an actor. Yeah. And if you do anything else, um, I think it can be detrimental. Even now I, 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 there was a casting director who came and saw my one man show and I only hear from her if there's a, a magic role and it pisses me off, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm like, this, this is not how I want you to think of me. Um, it's not as bad probably now as it was then in the nineties when I got there, but yeah, I would go to auditions and people would be like, like I saw you at the magic castle or you did my kid's birthday party. What are you doing here? You know, uh, you know, I do. I, when I did groundlings here, I didn't, uh, which is improvisation. Um, I yeah. didn't really talk about me being a magician. And if it, it it came up occasionally and I'd say I was a magician, I never showed anyone a trick. I never did any magic till the end. Um, right. I I think it's more open today. And I, I, I kind of take the opinion that at least I don't have to work in a bar or be a, uh, yeah. a waiter. And, uh, you know, nothing, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And I've done all that stuff. And I yeah. love it. I love uh, that area of things as well and ironically as a waiter you could probably make more money than doing a restaurant gig just yeah. because yeah, you get t- a forced 18 percent tip yeah and um, like the, the the castle bar people were you know there were there was certainly good money going around sloshing around there i was on the board of directors they were doing all right i can tell you <laughs> yeah, they were doing all right but but uh you know the yeah i just you know i feel like that I'm, I, 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 you've got to be a polymath in these days. You've got to be able to do so many things. You know, one of the things you've got to be able to do now is to run a camera, sound technology, do a zoom show, whatever it takes and, and, um, move with the times. Magic is one of those things. Do you want to be a magician? Do you want to be an actor? And I, and I feel like until you set yourself up as an actor, if that's what you really want, then you acting is what you need to focus on. You need to do plays. You need to be in class. You need to be, seen acting and uh once you've established yourself i got back into magic after doing 250 hours of tv and film i felt all right i'm known as an actor no matter what people may think of me as an actor i'm at least i've established myself with experience and i feel more comfortable now doing going back into magic from a different perspective but i think Um, i think you've also you know there's a sense that you, you you it's even just talking now about magic. You can see the joy that you've. You, I love it, but I love it because I'm not doing it for a living. Yeah, and I'm not. So I love the history of it. I love the, the coming across really interesting things. Um, 
there's, uh, for example, I was visiting a magician in, in, uh, in Niagara called uh, Eddie Dijon, who was an all-time working pro. He's in his 80s now. And Eddie's getting rid of all of his old props that have been in his garage for 20 years. You know, and I came across this. This makes me happy. This is old Terry Seabrook signed building wallet. But this is in the original packaging from Repro 71. There's a bit of history right here. And, and it's even got the envelopes, the original envelopes and the stickers that came with the, came with the trick. I've got this is a Thayer piece that, that is called Cobra, and it's a handkerchief that comes out and moves all over the place. Got that from it. And this uh, I got from our friend Billy Kidd, who, found, who talked to someone who knew um, the, the son of Bob Austin, the great English close-up magician. This is Bob, these are Bob Austin's diminishing cards in here. Oh, wow. These are what he used uh, when he was doing his diminishing cards routine. On Magic on the Go, I have 20 methods um, filmed and teach and taught on this plot because I love this, this plot of the cards shrinking. But, this is, but Bob made this little stand, and there's a little thing that holds it. So now that becomes a place where I can put the cards as they shrink. Uh, but also, I can do ditching if I need to. Let me say that in a more kind of not quite clear for the un <laughs> for the muggles out there. Um, uh, but also at the very end of it, you know, you close it up and you put this in your pocket. And you're ready to go, and it's it protects the cards. Mm-hmm. So I love these little things, you know. And then I discovered that Bob's presentation was only for kids. He would only do kids' birthday parties, diminishing cards, which is, how, you know, it, it's. I love that stuff. You know, I love this. These are, my goodness, these are, this is a trick called the, <clears throat> I just uploaded this to, or maybe I'm about to, I forget. I think I'm about to upload this to Magic on the Go. It's called the Missing Film Star Mystery. Mm-hmm. And this is from 1920s. And it was a trick that was marketed by a guy called Edward Bagshaw. And it has to do with celebrity names. But you, but what I love about this is, they're of the these time. Are, these are celebrities from Frederick Marsh. Frederick Marsh, from that era, you know, Marnie Nixon, Paul Mooney, Lupe Velez, Greta Garbo. And so the trick is like, these are super old cards that Bagshaw put out, comes with the, inst- still in the box, still with the instructions. It's a great trick. Wow. I love coming. I love the smell, you know, the smell of the old cards. I love coming across this stuff. You went to and London then, and, and, and you were in Davenport's, weren't you? Uh, last year, the year before. I went to visit a f- Roy. Roy Davenport is a friend of mine. Roy and I are working on an idea for a, a reality uh, series. And so I went to visit him at, at Davenport's Magical Kingdom, which is up in Norfolk. And they are opening now the vaults. So da- for those who don't know, Davenport's is this incredible magic shop that's been around for over 100 years. Uh, Roy Davenport, his great-grandfather, started uh, was a great great I think his great grandfather started the business in the late 1800s. Um, and so uh, every, part of what they would do is anytime a big illusionist or famous magician would die quite often, the estate would be bought by the Davenports with the, on, with the idea that it was a number of reasons. One, it was to preserve the secrets so that, you know, a lot of what these magicians were doing didn't just end up in everybody's act. Another reason was to potentially market what a couple of the pieces and to preserve the props and maybe even take live shows, uh, redo the shows, hire another magician, slot him in to go out and do the, you know, Oswald Williams show or, or masculines or whatever. And so they bought all this stuff, but what ended up happening was all these props and one-offs ended up being put into warehouses all around England. And, you know, life goes on, business goes on wars, world war one, world war two, all these things come and go. And they have no idea what they have. So in recent years, they've started opening these vaults. And uh, it's thrilling to go and see Oswald Williams's uh, red and green box that nobody's seen since uh, the 30s when Oswald died. Like just to go and help. And and so part of the show idea is to actually go through this stuff and to open up these boxes for the first time and see what's in them. And quite, and as I'm walking around these old props and Arnold de Beer's equipment, that was all made by this mechanic called John Martin or Louis Nicola's uh, uh, vanishing water trick, which was really, really clever. Or one box that contained just a shit ton of magnesium. And you're like, Ooh, that's not safe. You know, it's just like, you don't know what you're going to get. They bought all of masculines. They've got 
they've got the signing books, they've got the autograph books, they've got all the correspondence between Will Goldston and uh, Houdini and Will Goldston. And, and so it's such an amazing resource. That was one of the most exciting, magical experiences of my life to go and to hold these props that hadn't maybe been held or removed from a box for a hundred years. I love that. Do you think you look at a script uh, from an acting perspective? Is there a similarity in how you assess a magic trick or instructions or that delving into it, that kind of... I can look at something and know more consciously now than before whether it's going to work. So I think... I never used to write scripts out before I started working as, a, as an actor. I would just kind of create on the go and kind of remember the gags and kind of rough idea of what I was going to do. And then because I did the one man show, I started writing the screenplay. And once I wrote the script for it, then that was it. Then I was like, I love this process because it forces you to look at something as an arc, as a piece, as a performance piece, you know, and you start naming each one of the things the illusionist does is like, what are you going to call? What's the title for this piece? You know, the old magicians used to have titles, like, you know, the, the coin of Satan or whatever. You know, Lovely. you have a title for a piece, and that's artistic. That's a piece of uh, performance art. Uh-huh. And not just the color-changing silks, but the, you know, the death of the silkworm. It's whatever it is. But you, so you write, you know. So when I look at a piece now, um, yeah, I can immediately tell whether the structure of it is going to work so for magic on the go right now i've started doing a like a c2p level um course on the egg bag filming it right now done a whole bunch of stuff i've pieced together by research horace golden's egg bag routine i've i've uh which was the greatest thing he did he would do buzz soaring a woman in half but all the audience and the reviewers would talk about was how great the trick was with the egg in the bag so it's, it's a trick for those who don't know. It's been around for hundreds of years. Um, it, it got to the point where everyone was doing it in the 20s and 30s to the point where theater managers would have a sign backstage saying no egg bags. It was <laughs> that it was done so much. A bit like no Omni uh, deck. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like no, no Omni decks, please. <laughs> I will not hold that deck of cards in my hand. No, I will not do it. Um, and so, I've been researching egg bag and now I can look at a, say a paragraph that's in a description of someone performing it from the thirties and go, ah, oh, that's a great idea. Um, I'll give you an example. John Mulholland, who was a magician from the early 1900s, um, wrote an article in a magic magazine called the Sphinx about perverse magic where things that things pervert, there were people that were doing perverse magic acts where they were, or burlesque magic acts where they were exposing the tricks on purpose for the laugh, right? And uh, there was a couple of very successful acts at the time who were getting a lot of flack by magicians for exposing the tricks, very much like Tommy Cooper, right? Tommy Cooper would expose the tricks. Um, and so what Mulholland did was he put a list, a bunch of articles uh, about how to do burlesque magic without exposing the trick. And one of his ideas, and I don't know if he ever did it, but I read this and immediately I knew the dramatic possibilities of it, was you're going to do the egg bag. And so you show the bag and you show an egg and you have, it's a real egg and you place it on the table. And as you're talking to the audience and you're showing the bag inside out, the egg starts slowly rolling towards you, right? Slowly rolling towards the edge of the table. And you're pontificating about how normal the bag is. And meanwhile, this egg is coming towards you or going towards the audience if they're right there. But I think it's really funny. And you can see, and you're laughing, you can see the situation now. The audience is, oh shit, this thing is going to like smash onto the floor. It's going to make a mess. Um, and just the very last second you turn, you pick up the egg and you start the trick as if you weren't even aware of this. And you, you're completely, the egg is completely under your control. So you can time the roll to, to fit the speech within the second because of the method that he explained. And I looked at that and I'm like, that's, that's a great moment. 
That is, I can immediately see the arc of that moment within any egg bag routine. Um, two things important. They've got to believe it's a real egg and they've got to be able to see the table. So you can't do it everywhere. Yeah. But uh, so those, you know, yeah. When I look at a script now, I'm like, what is, what is the, what is the arc of it? What's the story I can put in there? What is the, what is about this? that's going to astonish me. What am I going to get out of this? What, what do I want my audience to think? The thing with the chocolate box trick is it's a really, really good trick, but it's a better trick. If I emphasize everything that's impossible about it. Um, And I discovered by writing the script out, the moments that needed filling with gags and business, because there was a lot of procedure, getting a guy up, chocolate box empty, coin, sign it, seal it in the box, rubber bands. So for me, part of the procedure was emphasizing nothing wrong with the box. Get a flashlight out, shine it, no holes in there, put it on there. You're satisfied, put the rubber bands on. It's still in there. You look suspicious, take the rubber bands back off, have a look inside. It's still in there. Very conus aces, right? Are you sure the coin is in there? You're abs- no way I can get that out, right? Absolutely, go over there. Dollar bill, you folded it up, you put it inside the glass. No way I can get to that. Hold it right there. Don't move, don't move. Take the shot. You can hear the coin in the box. And then I shut up because I discovered that as a magician, and the power of silence is very powerful. Um, So the magic needed to happen without distraction. And so that was into a pin spot, shaking the box. You can hear the coin rattling and then listen. No more rattle. No more coin. It's gone. And it was, that effect had a a ripple effect on the audience where you could hear people going, no. And I only discovered that because I did it when I was practicing it originally. I did it at the bar at the castle. And I remember shaking the box and this woman freaking out. She didn't even wait for me to open the box to show that the coin was gone. As far as she was concerned, when there was no rattle, that was it. The coin was gone. And I realized that's the moment of magic, right? That's the moment of astonishment. As a box has been examined, it's been surrounded by rubber bands. It's got a coin rattling around inside. Suddenly I've got, no, I can't touch the coin. I can't manipulate it. Um, And now the coin is gone. And then I look over at the lady and the audience is ahead of me. The lady is holding the bill. Uh, and the audience is, is the, in their mind, that coin is already inside the dollar bill, right? At that point, I'm like, you've been holding that the whole time. Audiences love to jump ahead, but them jumping ahead psychologically has enabled me to do what I need to do to get the coin inside the bill. By the end of the tour, I discovered by accident that when they're holding the glass with the dollar bill in it, they're not really focused on it. They're watching what's going on here. That if they shook the glass the bill would, because it had a, now had a coin in it, uh, would be heavier. And when it would land in the glass, it was almost as if that was the moment the coin appeared in the glass. And you only get these moments by performing, right? So I would say that, I would say, uh, shake the glass. The first time it happened, I was like, shake the glass. And the woman shook the glass. She goes, oh my God. I'm like what? She goes, it just, something, something's inside the bill now, you know? And I was like, if I can duplicate that reaction every night, I've also not just got the impossible vanish, I've got the hands-off appearance, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so you learn, you, you learn by, I'm rambling, but you learn by doing, you know? And that's uh, the structure of the whole thing. And most of that came about by looking at the routine as, a, as an arc, as a performance piece, rather than just doing a trick. So now when you... Uh going into the acting specifically yeah what is it you would like i mean do you look at it and think you know this is where i want to be or do you look at it and think this is a gig this is great i'm doing a gig you know because certainly as a magician you're you're making very um specific choices about what you will and won't do and i know you do that in acting as well but 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 there's also I've got to make a living. To a degree, to a degree. <laughs> yeah, to a degree. Yeah. Listen, we're all whores, right? In the end, uh, you have to make a decision: Are you going to hold out for that top one percent Oscar-winning script? Yeah. Or are you going to be a jobber? Are you going to work? I mean, I've done many a gig for money, and many a magic gig for money, and many a uh, many an acting gig for mm-hmm. money. 
Um, or I remember I did a movie years ago, and it's it's awful. But I remember it being it was the first movie role I ever got, and like a larger movie role. And um, I wasn't so concerned about it not being an Oscar winning movie. I, I just wanted to do it and to get that credit and uh, and get that experience, you know. Uh, but there are actors out there who refuse to do anything, but you know, it has to be top percentage kind of material the crown you know that kind of quality of television um but i feel like uh only recently have i started saying i don't want to do that character um either it's someone i've played a million times or like this role came up of this kind of i mean it was it was he was this uh uh guy who was um, a neighbor of someone who uh, was, seems like a nice guy up front, but was really very racist. And it was just kind of incendiary. It wasn't, uh, there wasn't a point to it. There wasn't, uh, um, uh, it wasn't cleverly written. It was just, you know, a a guy who's a racist so we can get everyone's blood boiling for the scene. And and, And I was like, I don't, see the value in now performing that mm-hmm. um having said that i might go off and do a villain you know for the cw who knows that's but uh for magic i i did many horrible gig many a horrible gig for the for the cash and um but there is something there is something uh, to to think about also in those jobs i mean you do that film yeah. You don't know who who these people you're working with are yeah. and will be. Um, yeah. We're all going through those experiences, those little right. networks. You know, I, when I did my short film, the guys I work with become great friends, and we're doing other stuff. Exactly, and this is the thing, and this is what you need to decide: in that you don't know going from one job to the next what that is in the big scheme of the big plan, right? So. Michael, I often talk about Michael Caine because his book, Elephant to Hollywood, is a brilliant example of someone looking back on his life and saying, I met this guy here and 10 years later, he called me for this. And you don't know. You just don't know. And, and anyway, whether, whether you think the script is, is mediocre or great, uh, it's an experience. And if you, you, know, you can be great in a mediocre film. Or is it better to be great in a mediocre film or mediocre in a great film? Uh, is the experience of working with those actors, of being on camera, of hitting your mark, and maybe the director has something that you'll take home, maybe the cinematographer, maybe you learn something about lighting and getting your light. Uh, all those things you will learn from experience. So, yes, I, I did a Disney series, which a lot of people said was a crazy thing to do right after doing a network drama. But for me, it was for a number of reasons. One was it was a slapstick. What show was that? You did Crossing it's Jordan. Called, uh, I'm in the band. The... I, I get to play Rockstar, which is everyone's dream. Right. And um, Some great pictures of you doing that. Yeah, yeah, with hair, hair which hair. wasn't mine, <laughs> and a singing voice that wasn't mine. Oh, right. Uh, le- tight leather pants. and uh, Was that yours? Yeah. Was that yours in the pants? Most of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was mine. Um, there's a reason why people wear leather pants, by the way. It's, Anyway, uh, but um, the point was that, the, you know, there were a number of reasons. One of them, this was a show, this was a kind of slapstick comedy that I'd never done. Like a Three Stooges, balls out, Velcro suit, jumping on the wall, hilarious. I got to, we got to do songs and numbers and, and, and uh, you know, rock uh, music. And, um, and it was an audience that I already had like, a, an, uh, like an audience of, say, 30 and above. Like when we talk about demographics, right? right. So you know, I had an audience of 30 and above from Crossing Jordan, which was six years, 120 episodes, network, primetime, top 20 show. Now, um, and the only reason it was canceled is because we've got a new chief of the network and uh, who one of the first things he did was get rid of the show, which he got into trouble for, I think, because the show was doing really well. Um, but uh, he cancelled the show, so there you go. So now I'm doing this other thing where my audience is kids, 14-year-olds is the, 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 the age for it. 14-year-old boys was what it was supposed to be for. Um, what we discovered was uh, girls love the show as much as boys. And um, internationally, 
uh, the show did great as well because it was uh, in Latin America. You know, the 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 idea of uh, being a rocker is a fantasy for a lot of kids. All those kids now are in their twenties. Uh, they're college students. They're in their mid to late twenties, and I'm always bumping into that young demographic, which is the demographic that you want uh, as a performer, as an actor. You know, uh, they all know me, so now I can. I've got that. So I've got that young demographic. I've got the older demographic. And so it's about building your audience, right? You know, mm-hmm. building, mm-hmm. you know, and also building that experience. And that's so for me, that was a great, great time. Best time. One of the best times I've ever had on a, on a show was doing that series. And it's, it, it's cyclical, the, the experience, you know, the fashionability yeah. we talked about, the, the, the coming back to certain things that come, you know, it happens with bands, you know, like Culture Club and Duran Duran or magicians yeah. like Paul Daniels or, you know, there were periods of time where they, they weren't fashionable. Fleetwood Mac, you know, went out of style. Oh, they're the old school. Who cares? And then suddenly yeah. they're found again. Zeppelin is found again. These kids are listening to Jimi Hendrix or yeah. they're watching The Godfather or... Rick Fleetwood was someone I met at the Magic Castle who uh, hired me to do his 50th birthday party. It was 50th. Maybe it was his 60th. It was his 50th. Mid-90s. And... Um, I remember he, hired, we had rent, he rented out this restaurant called Joffrey's in Malibu and did it there. And I did walk around close up magic for the whole night. And oh my God, that was the royalty of rock and roll was in that restaurant. And I remember, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Royal Rock and Eve, Dick, uh, guy that used to host the, uh, or cut this out and cut back to me knowing this <laughs> brilliantly. So I don't look like I'm losing my mind. Um, no, uh, uh, what did it, give me something? Dick. Dick uh, <laughs> I keep saying Dick. 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 So Dick you know, so Dick something productions. Uh, Dick, uh, uh, you know, used to do Rockin' Eve, uh, New Year's Eve show. Oh, uh, um, yeah. yes. Yeah. I know. How old are we? Well, that no. Guy. Yeah, that was, a, was an American guy reference. Um, Cabot? No, Cabot? Oh, no not, not Dick Cabot. No, no, uh, it wasn't Dick Cabot, but it was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just laughing how fucking old I am. Uh, oh, God. Well, no, um, look, uh, what Dick was it? Clark. Dick Clark. Oh, okay. there we go. I wouldn't, Dick Clark. Yeah. Dick Clark okay. Productions. Right. Know? So anyway, Dick Clark, who <laughs> was a massive... Let's cut that. So anyway, I was... <laughs> so, yeah, this guy, who could forget him? Dick Clark. Um, <laughs> Dick Clark would uh, uh, follow me around. Right. Doing magic for everybody, you know? And uh, that was an amazing time. You talk about Mick Fleetwood and everyone showed up except for uh, Stevie Nicks. Huh? And so there was a lot of talk about, you know, Lindsay Buckingham was there and everybody else was there. I ended up doing a music video for them uh, called, um, not Love is Hard on the Knees, that was... Uh, I did one for, I did one for Aerosmith called "Love Is Hard on the Knees," and I did this one, which was called uh, "Love Shines," which was the music video. Nice. And um, yeah, that all came out of that. So I remember Mick Fleetwood being just a great guy, and we were talking to him, and he's like, "I want people to, you know, help him get the the t-shirts because he had this person who was doing caricatures on a t-shirt. So we helped him get the t-shirts from downtown, and we met him and gave him this shirts, and you know, it was just uh, that was brilliant, brilliant memory." You bring up those guys. Yeah, well, you know, and so, you know, you said about the question, what do I think about this kind of magic versus um, actor thing now? I mean, I think... Yes, what do you think? This is the question. Well, I think it's... It's it's definitely not as bad as it was, and there was definitely a time was... Well, you know, I, I felt it very much in England. Well, you know, are you an actor or a magician? But which really? one are you? you yeah. know, what's the last acting gig you did? Well, you're a magician. Or... What's the last magic geek? Nah, and it felt very much like that. But now I feel much more, it, it's kind of a bonus. And, and also because like, I am a magician and I have a certain reputation in that area. So that's good. But I, I, I agree that I do feel that like, you know, I want to be recognized as, oh, Paul could be that character. He could be that actor. And right. you don't want to end up playing the magician all the time, although I yeah. have. Um, yeah me too uh, yeah and then you know you but you, you know the magic is certainly you know have good comedy timing and stylings as do you and you know if you watch your show reel there's even in the serious things there's that little glint behind the eye there's that little which i find you know that's that's the intangible thing i think as an actor that's the speciality yeah uh, well i i think that um 
it feeds. I, I, I always felt that my, when I was doing sitcom or, when, or even actually when I was doing anything dramatic, is, is if I've recently been in front of a live audience, uh, it just made me better in the studio. It just, there's just something about timing mm-hmm. um, and energy, energy. That, would, that, that, would, that would be good. Um, it's funny you say England is not is harder because I, I always look to England as being you can do a game show and you can uh, pop on to Sunday night at the London Palladium and then go off and do a TV series as an actor. You know, I always felt like people... I always felt that. Maybe I'm wrong, but if I always you, felt like you could do a bunch of different things and you weren't so judged for it. If you were in the club. If so, you're a water rat. If you're in the club. So, yeah. If you're in the club. You, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. That's the, but it's the same here. You have to find your way into the club um, of being accepted as the – it's – the person who's the, the the rock star and the actor who can go off and do a tour and then come back and do a TV series. Yes. And everyone's like, well, that's him. But it doesn't mean you can do it. Yeah, you're, you're dead right. It's like you have to be. So the hard part and the intangible part is, are you in the club? Everyone loves Charlie Sheen uh, to a point. Uh, I worked with Charlie on some a bunch of episodes of Anger Management. He's a lovely guy, just the most warm hearted. But there are people who who have rubbed in the wrong way and he's, gone like this right charlie had for years was had the ability to behave badly and yet still get i say badly i mean live the life a lot of people want to live you know drugs girls you name it um live the rock star lifestyle with beautiful women and just completely hedonistic and enjoyed his celebrity to the nth degree and yet people were always saying yeah, Charlie can play this and Charlie can do this and he's an actor and he's acceptable. Then you have certain actors who have been done one thing slightly scandalous and it's ruined their entire career. Uh, They weren't in the acceptability club for that level of behavior, you know? And so I think, I mean, you know, I love Hugh Grant. I love that Hugh Grant is having a comeback. Um, like a real fucking actor comeback. He's doing amazing work. His work as Jeremy Thorpe was really, really great. The, um, was Thorpe, wasn't it? Was Thorpe. Yeah. Um, but I was here in the 90s when he got caught with the girl, with, with um, whatever her name was. Yeah. And that destroyed his career. Why? It was one dalliance compared to what a lot of other people were doing in the nineties was nothing, you know, who's to say how something affects your career. So magic to bring it back can, can be that one thing that you do on the tonight show that sets you up and above everybody else, or it can be how everyone perceives you and you can't get past it. Yeah. Um, And the question is whether you want to take that risk. Taking risk. I think that's a good point to kind of uh, tie it all up. Um, taking yeah. the risk. Um, you just finished uh, a sitcom a bit. You were in Mum. Yeah, I'm doing a bunch of episodes of that. You're doing That's, a few episodes. Uh, yeah, I'll be back in January oh, to do sweet. more. Yeah, I. I uh, uh, that was great. Yeah, that was as an actor. So I've worked with Chuck Lorre for many, many years, on uh-huh. and off, very different shows, pilots, you name it, and uh, he's, he's had an he's had an incredible career. And uh, he, you know, they literally, it's so funny, you know, you as an actor, you're always auditioning. No matter what you've done, you're auditioning. Hmm. And this was a phone call. This was just like, it's something that Steve wants to do. And I was like, absolutely. Do, uh, Alice and Janney, are you kidding me? So I flew in to do it. And um, everyone was telling me how lovely Alison was. And I've worked with actors and actresses that have been great. And I've worked with actors and actresses that are nothing like their stage persona that are just horrible human beings. And Alison was amazing. She was so warm and welcoming and loving. But more than that, when we were doing our scenes for the first time ever in my entire career, I felt scenes fly by. There were, it was over before I knew it. It the energy was up here and it was like riding a roller coaster of, of uh, com- 
just completely being immersed in the scene with Alison. That's absolutely her. She's so generous in giving as an actress that you, you can't help but be drawn. So you try as an actor, you know, you don't want to be the weakest link. Um, and so you're hyper aware that you're working with an Oscar winning actress, Emmy winning actress, and, and you fucking better be there and ready. But at the same time, she then lifts you up to a whole nother level. And, and I, I've rarely experienced that. And I've been acting for more than 30 years and that really, and that, so you're always learning and you're always kind of like growing. And, and I felt like, uh, in some ways, um, like a newbie, you know, in a, in like, I felt like someone doing a scene with Meryl Streep for the first time. Mm-hmm. It just, she's just that caliber and quality of actor. Um, so t- for me to be going back and doing more episodes is, I can't wait. And you don't, you didn't know, you didn't know it was going to be more episodes, did you, at the time? When you we knew it was going to be recurring. Okay. But I think, but they only booked me officially on the one. You know, there's a number of things they've got to think about. One is like, do we have any, any chemistry on camera? Is it going to work? Does the storyline work? But the, the episode ends with her becoming my sponsor. So, yeah, you know, that's an open-ended storyline. Like, what is I, your character? Who, who is he? <laughs> He's an old rocker. <laughs> I have a tendency to play. You know, I once bumped into Tim Curry in the very early nineties <laughs> at a party. Right. And this is absolutely true. And, and he, and, and he said, uh, or maybe it was the castle, but I'll never forget. He said, I said, I'm an actor. I would do that. Oh, I'm an actor too. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And he, and he said, and I said, I've just moved here, you know, from South end. And he said, you'll have a lovely career playing villains and maitre d's. And, uh, he was damn right, man. And you'd add rock stars to that. Uh, Are you English? Are you people. an English character or an American? Yeah, English. English. Yeah, English rock star. Um, it's really fun. I met a lot of rockers in my day in the 90s when I was working. Um, like I said, Mick Fleetwood, but also people like Dave Edmonds, who is a magic nut, loves magic. You know, I met all these guys at the castle. Dave Edmonds. Uh, Nathan East, who yeah. plays with Eric Clapton's band, yeah. bass. So yeah. with a uh, great Sting. close-up guy, Brilliant. super skillful close-up. Oh, guy. really? Jay Graydon, who's uh, yeah, Nathan's great. Um, uh, Jay Graydon, who's who wrote after the Love's Gone with David Foster. Oh, nice. Um, just uh, amazing, uh, uh, amazing people in the music business. So I've been kind of. And I always thought I knew more. I knew more people in the music industry than I did in the acting and magic industry. And I thought if I could bloody actually sing like a rock star, I might have had a career in that field. <laughs> but that's always the way it goes, you know. Um, so yeah. So for this show, I get to play another rocker. And so it was. And and it was the guy who kind of was kind of worked his way to the middle and never was a big rock star, but always thought he was. Uh-huh. Um, and is in rehab. And the hilarious part is I've had messages from so many friends of mine in LA who saw the episode and said, that's like my, uh, that's like my rehab group. I know I have guys in my, who was it? Kristen, Kristen who's on the show. Um, when she, when I did my first scene where I get up and I'm, I'm doing a share at, at a 12 step group <laughs> and I'm, uh, sh- and I'm in my silk shirt with my leather know, pants again, my kind of rock star jeans. eye makeup and the bouffanted hair and all the rest of it. Um, right afterwards, she was laughing her ass off. She's like, that's my group. There are people in my group in, I guess, West Hollywood or Malibu, wherever she is, who are that person. Like, and that's a great character to play. And, uh, uh, so yeah, so I get to do that. I, I get to figure out what's, what's coming next. I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to go back and check it out. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. That's and you know, it's pilot season, so who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Whatever that means these days. Yeah. I think it's going to, uh, I, I, I actually imagine it's going to be full force because there's a definite need for, for good content and for content. And now. There is. And there's a there bit is. of hope at the end of the tunnel, a bit of light yeah. coming through. I usually do a pilot a year and, and you can make a living. You can't you used to be able to make a living doing pilots. You can't do it now. But uh, you know, people will say, where's that actor been? You know, and it's like, well, he just did three pilots, none of which got picked up. So, uh, you know, good luck with that career. But I, it's um, if, OK. So if you were uh, if you were offered, what would you do? Would you want to do a pilot 
Or would you want to do a recurring character, say, on a series that's already on the air? Uh, would you want to do like a lead in a pilot or a recurring character on a series already on the air? Um, I think from, well, practicality would be a series already on the air. Right. Uh, artistically, potentially, the pilot with the lead. Right. Um, now, I think the show that's already on the air is more interesting because I've seen how hard it is to get yeah. shit on the air and how to have, have stuff stay. And I've had that situation come up a couple of times recently where it's been like, there's a recurring character on this one series. Uh, and by the way, do you want to read for this other one as a series regular? You know, and I'm like, well, I can look at the script and go, I don't think that's going to make it, but I don't want to have to lock myself in. Um, so these are, these are the interesting kind of conflicts and dilemmas that you have to sometimes deal with as an actor. I, um, I'll tell you, you helped me on an audition did I ever tell you what happened with that? No. <laughs> so for those who don't know, I was auditioning for a show. What was the name? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it out. The teacher. Um, you were the teacher. Was it Legends? No, it wasn't Legends. It was... Uh, was it like it was a the professor one where, or teacher character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a CW show. I actually really liked the show. It's about like werewolves and vampire kids yeah. and they're all at high school together. And there was a role of a new recurring character uh, and that maybe it would have become a series regular at some point. And it was a teacher. And if you remember, uh, Paul was very nice uh, to, to let me film with me. And, and we did it over and over again because it was a shit ton of dialogue, <laughs> had to be delivered fast and furious. And, and I, ha- I I actually, you know, kind of got into like a little bit of directing. I had to kind of, I sat back a little, let you do your thing. And mm-hmm. then I was like, can I just, maybe you might want to, is this all right? If I, and then eventually it's like, do this, try that. Maybe and and then I was able to use my annoyance uh, from that situation as power for the character. Oh, good, <laughs> no, so it all worked. I'm good. Yeah, carry but, on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck, it's directing me now. <laughs> Can't help it. Just point the goddamn camera. You do the um, same thing as well. Yeah, no, of course. That's for sure. You can't help it. I mean, I know my, my wife auditions for stuff and then I'm like, can I just, and she's like, what? <laughs> you know. But actually that's um, great. That's great when you do that. Anyway. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, you like, you need a director. You if, need someone. If, and outskirts. you've got to have the rapport and, 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 and feel comfortable. Yes. Yeah. But here's an example of what show business is like yeah. and how fucked up it is. <laughs> I read for that role. It wasn't legends of tomorrow. Anyway. Anyway, I read for the role. As you know, we put a lot of time and effort into that audition. Like everybody does. Uh, I get a call saying, my agent saying, all right, you've got the part. Congratulations. Uh, you're going to spend the rest of the summer in Atlanta, the rest of the year in Atlanta, uh, you know, as the new teacher on this show. And then two days later, I get a call saying, oh, no, sorry, they've decided to give it to somebody else. So you apparently one of the producers hadn't weighed in yet and had decided it was going to go to somebody else. That was a, I've been in the business a long time. That was a brutal fucking moment as not just an actor, but as a human being, like, you know, who does that? Who calls someone up and says, uh, yeah, he's got the part. And then turns around two days later and says, no, sorry, it made a mistake. It's going to somebody else. Like that's, but that's the nature of showbiz. And that's why actors who get a lot of shit in the media for being outspoken or making too much money, that's why we make a lot of money when we work is because that's the shit that we have to deal with on a regular basis, auditions and that kind of treatment, unfortunately. Um, that, oh, to say I was angry, I was furious. Yeah, but I was more like, I try not to be hurt by these situations because I don't think it's personal. It's just tacky, tacky behavior and it's unnecessary. Uh, so yeah, that was, um, that was an interesting ride, man. You know, that was just what last year. Yeah. It was, yeah. um, end of last year. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And then I get a call from Chuck Laurie's office. Does Steve want to do mum? So it's just that this is, it's a crazy business. Is mum in the, in the UK. Because uh, I know it must be because it's an because just... you know it's a Chuck Lorre uh, major uh, network sitcom. So I'm assuming it's because I never I, I didn't know of it and it's big over here. Um, it's been on for like eight or nine years, right? So um, that's you know and 
yeah, Alison, Janney, and Anna Faris. Although Anna's, I don't think she's doing this season. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to tell me. <laughs> your family, your British fan base, will have to look it up for me. Yeah, I'll have to get on the case and, and get it. Make sure it's seen there. Yeah. That's, anyway, yeah. welcome to LA. Brilliant. And you're going to look forward to wonderful experiences <laughs> like that. Yeah. In, in fact, you you said as you left and went moved to Canada, I said uh, I'm handing over the keys of uh, Hollywood to you, Paul. <laughs> And, I and, uh, and I was like, right, city's yours now. Yeah, and, treat and, it well. And I had fr- mutual friends going, "Oh, Steve just said he'd given you Hollywood," and I was like, "Oh, yeah, great." And uh, and then um, you know, the situation, <laughs> yeah. the shit hit the fan. But we're gonna come out of it even more. You know, the Roaring Twenties happened after the uh, the Spanish flu, so uh, right, we're yeah, we're gonna go into a Roaring Twenties. I think we are. And I think it's like, I'll take a little Oxford vaccine right here. I'll take a little Pfizer vaccine right here. And, uh, you know, I'll do a little cocktail of vaccines. And uh, I'm going to be up. The idea of being in a room with 5,000 people all laughing and pointing in the direct mic and all that, those water droplets coming towards (laughs) me on stage has become a year ago was fine. A year ago I was on tour. Uh, And now I want to get back to that position where I don't, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, and, and, and one thing I would say is get ready, you know, be ready. I mean, don't buy into the negative narrative. Don't buy into the bullshit yeah. that's going on. Buy into the for everybody. For everybody. Be ready for everybody. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for having used, if you are financially able to, um, use this time to work on your craft and, uh, and build your knowledge and, build your acts, you know, and, and to circle back to what you said about Zoom shows, I feel like they have a place. John Armstrong said something very interesting. He, he said, uh, um, even if it's a small part of the market, it's a part of the market that didn't exist a year ago. So it's worth looking at from that perspective. And and I think that's a smart attitude. I sometimes feel like as magicians, we don't want to move forward. As I said, you know, we're very traditionalists. Um, I sometimes feel like we're we're like the people who didn't want, who thought talking pictures was not going to stay. Like, are we moving from silent pictures into talkies right now? Is this what is happening to us as, as performers? And we need to look at that and think about that. That's, um, and yeah, and I don't think the zoom show will go away. I think the zoom show will find its place, Uh, but I think live will definitely come back. But I think that, you know, it's just another tool. It's another tool. Yeah, it's exactly. It's another performance art, Instagram magic, all those tricks that we read about over the years that we couldn't do. And we were so angry about when we bought them because the <laughs> angles sucked. Guess what? You can do them to camera now. And that's a gift, man. I've, I've got a closet full of it that I couldn't do to one, barely to one person, because if I move my hand this way or this way, yeah. you'd see how it works. It's all available to me now. This is great. I can use that stuff. You know, there's a, so I, uh, I think there's a place for it. Yeah. And there's a place for all of this. Yeah. If you listen to uh, what other people tell you, I mean, like I've said a million times, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I wouldn't be in LA. I wouldn't be yeah. an actor. I wouldn't be a magician. If I'd listened to those people who said, you know, well, you know, that's really hard. That's really difficult. You wouldn't have come out to Hollywood. You wouldn't have come to the Magic Castle. None of that would have happened. Do you know why I came out? I, I came out because. I, the main reason I came out was uh, a friend of mine years ago, Sue Devaney, who's a British actress. She was on Coronation Street for a while. And Sue and Michelle Holmes were two actresses that I knew when I was in my teens. And um, I remember we were all hanging out in the late, in the mid, uh, mid to late eighties. And she said something along the lines of, you know, you know what we should do we should just go out to Hollywood and knock on doors and show them out knock on the agent's doors and just show them how acting is done. You know, this, you know, we were laughing about, let's go show them what British actors are all about. And then she looked at me and she said, she said something along the lines of, you should go, you've got nothing, either you, you've got nothing going on in your life or you've got nothing to lose or something along those lines. And that always stayed with me. And then eventually that's, that was the reason why I was like, you know, if I, I'm going to sell everything I have and move to LA. And I, I'd met uh, uh, my first wife, who was American. So she didn't want to live in England at that point. So rather than move to Michigan, uh, which is where she was from, uh, you know, I was like, let's go to, let's go to Hollywood. And so I sold everything, got me a couple of thousand bucks in my pocket. Didn't think about anything other than just, we just jumped on a plane and came to Hollywood and 
didn't think about the fact that we would run out of money in two weeks or that I didn't have credit or I didn't know anybody or, you know, and that's the naivety of youth. Uh, I admire what you're doing because you don't have the naivety of youth. You, you're, a, you're somebody who's fully well aware of the uh, possibilities of what can go right and what can go wrong moving to another country. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, when somebody said, you have credit? I was like, what's that? <laughs> you know, so, uh, so that's, you know, you've got to follow that gut. But my gut feeling was, had, was always to, to move to LA and to pursue acting in that way, always. You know, well, I think that's a, a great moment to end on, um, on a positive oh, note. Right, okay. <laughs> yes. let's, let's, let's end on that moment. Um, uh, what? I, what? I, um, I feel like man- doing a mouth coil. <laughs> what? Go ahead. Uh, people will wonder that what that is, uh, but um, go ahead. <laughs> hmm? So uh, yeah, I. I uh, oh, it's flipped back to me. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> go ahead, Paul. Yeah, he's uh, pulling um, a coil of paper out of his mouth. That's what we do. Oh. <laughs> What's the golf <laughs> and, and, Yeah, still going. <laughs> Regretting it now. I, I am, actually. I know how long this fucking thing is. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, yeah. yeah. Um, for those who are just listening, exactly. there was just a, an endless ream of s- stuff spewing out of Wait, his what, mouth. What? What? <laughs> what? Uh, Sorry, I wasn't. Uh, yeah. Can you believe that was in my mouth? Now, a lot of people would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, As sorry, the I've never done the a mouth coil before. I bought a box of them, and I thought, where better to? Um, to try out my first mouth coil, but on your show, perfect, I just, I just broke my mouth coil. Uh, Cherry, C- right cutting there. edge uh, magic. So cutting edge comedy magic. <laughs> if people wanted to, uh, so magic on the go is for. I mean, this is for magicians. Yeah, is it? For, well, it's for anyone who loves magic. I'm kind it, of like it originally was designed as a um, yeah a course for anybody who wants to learn magic. Yeah, but the way it's grown in the last three years has really been about the love of magic. So for me, it's if you love magic, this is the site for you. Because we, yes, we talk about tricks and moves and original stuff and stuff from the past. And I'll investigate a topic like the diminishing cards or cards to pocket or whatever. But also there's, I like to look at the history of it, look at the credits, look at like where stuff came from. um, And kind of, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants kind of thing. Let's not forget what they experienced and created back in their time because uh, we can springboard from that. And there's so much great stuff from the past that we can, we can use today. So magic on the goes really has become a site to go to. If you love magic, is it a subscription? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can go monthly or annually. It's a much better deal annually. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's a great deal. No matter what, it's super cheap. It works out like 10 bucks a month. Magic on the go.com magic on the go.com. And, um, I'm always uploading stuff. I'm always uh, putting new stuff up. And we're over 500 videos now. Wow. You know, and that's insane. When I look back at how much I've put on there already. And there was times when I was like, I can't do this. I can't keep this going. I'm a one man shop. I research it, write it, learn it, film it, edit it, put it up myself. So sometimes there'll be a video shot in a hotel room or there was a bunch of stuff. I started the egg bag stuff while I was in quarantine just because I needed to get it going. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but it's uh, it's really a labor of love. And so if you're someone who loves magic and just likes all aspects of it and finds it inspiring and really fascinating topic, then this is, this is the site for you. You can get lost in it. You know, you can go and get lost in the site and, uh, and uh, I'm just going to keep, uh, keep adding to it until, until I can't. And you've got a lot of original stuff as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, you've inspired a lot of magicians that I know who, uh, uh, have worked your stuff stolen it yeah well there's I've put a lot of well what happens is is thank you but what happens is is you you so I mean I've got C2P the cards to pocket thing so that's huge um, 
that's a seven disc set where you've got behind you there. So, um, but also there's, um, I mean, that is, yeah, that's there. But what happens is, and this is what's fascinating about the human that's brain. That's that. I'm just getting that yeah, on there. That's me right there. That's there me. Look at Photoshop. Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Love it. Um, what's fascinating is I've also got three, my three card Monty's up there. I mean, my cloth DVD set is all up there and I'm just about to upload booked, which was my, probably the, most successful thing I've ever put out, oh, which yeah. is the book test that everybody did on every Got Talent. Um, and uh, but what's here's what's fascinating about it. I'll let you go after this. But when you teach, right? When you learn something and then you, you do it from the perspective of teaching. In order to teach, you have to understand. So in order to teach, you have to look at it from a. You have to dissect what you're what you're uh, what you're teaching. It is the best way to learn magic, first of all, because you have to learn it to teach it. And in doing so, you end up coming up with new ideas that you would never have come up with from often in the middle of filming. Like in the middle of filming, I might go, oh, and here's an idea. You could do this. And suddenly I've got an original piece that's come out of, you know, I'm working on my own personal egg bag routine right now, which is inspired by, there's 300 different things I've found so far on egg bag. 300, whether it's a bit like the Mulholland bit or whether it's the reason I got the mouth coil, which is because there's a moment where you switch the egg for the mouth coil and you pop it in your mouth and go, the egg's gone. And the kids are like, oh, it's in your mouth. And then you're like, no, it's not. Oh, hang on, hang on. And you've got that moment. Um, but, but you just, you come up with original material, not when you're trying to come up with original material, but by immersing yourself in a topic and then learning it to teach. It's a different side of the brain, man. And, and, I've come up with so much stuff I would never have thought of and ever because I've been doing this. So magic on the go purely selfishly is, uh, is, uh, has been a great thing for me too. I learn every, every week. You've always been, um, you know, we've sat in the car. I remember you had uh, some pamphlet you just got and you started talking to me about the history of this particular trick and where, if I knew anything about it and, you know, you, you, you dig deep, you don't, um, yeah. you don't take it for granted. I don't like, for example, yeah. uh, drinking the news, right? Classic trick. Uh, just for describe. Those who don't know, yeah. you take a newspaper, yeah. you pour a drink into the newspaper, and then the drink you open up the paper, the drink's gone, liquid's gone. You can turn it upside down, page through the paper, it's gone. But at any point, you can fold up the paper and pour the drink back out, right? It's a classic trick. No one knows where it came from. It's been around forever. Now, I had an idea that it would be really great to do that in an egg bag. <laughs> right at some point you take your drink pour it in the egg bag or do an egg bag and at the very end of it pour yourself out a drink eggnog or you know uh, some kind of egg cocktail It'd be really kind of fun um yeah, billy kid and i have argued for for years about why do magicians break open the egg at the end of the egg bag what is the point of that if the audience believes it's an egg then why do you need to break it open it's kind of now you've got a mess to deal with you know and yet it is it seems to be an applause point um so if you are going to do that, then why not pour a drink out into, and then crack the egg into the cocktail so you've made yourself like some big egg float cocktail. So I'm thinking this is an original idea, and, um, and I'm very excited about this. And the gimmicks are now made of a size where you can get them from Prop Dog, and they're really, really, really well made. I'm not getting paid for this ad, but I'm saying that they make a, a size that's perfect for, for egg bag. So I'm doing my usual research into egg bag, and I come across this one article about Douglas Francis who wrote a lot of stuff up for the Gen magazine back in the day, was a working professional magician who in his, had an act, a bathroom act. And one of the things he would do would be an egg bag with a bar of soap and a, a toiletry bag. And at the end of it, would pour out water from the bag. And now, of course, I'm pissed off because I thought I had an original moment. And this, by the way, is a problem with research. It is a heartbreaking thing. You will always find somebody else had this idea first. Then I do more research and discover that the inventor of drinking the news was Douglas Francis, Dougie Francis, who originally put it out with um, Stanley, Harry Stanley as a late night final. That was the trick. Wow. So for those magicians who want to know, uh, Dougie Francis uh, deserves your, your credit and, and thanks. Um, and uh, he used it in an egg bag, it would seem, uh, so I'm no longer, that isn't an original idea anymore, but it's something I'm definitely working on putting into my show in a maybe slightly different format. 
it's interesting because but, you, the new, newspapers might not be around. No, exactly. So what are we going to, how are we going to do that trick? A bag makes perfect sense in a way, handkerchief. Uh, but you know, this is, this is the joy that I have in researching and coming up with ideas and then realizing that, you know, people have been doing this a lot longer than me for many more years and centuries than I have, and probably have already had these ideas at some point or another. Um, and it just validates, validates what I'm doing in a way, but it's really fun. It's really fun. They go, oh, what about this? And they go, oh, shit, the guy was selling it. I had an idea about doing a wallet, having just a, shit, it's a regular wallet and having the egg bag folded up inside and then opening up the wallet, taking out the egg bag, reaching in and pulling out an egg, a real egg, based on the bowling ball production mm-hmm. and the tenure trick with the golf ball, basically, the similar, similar principle, right? And I'm like, just have it in a wallet. Great. A nice idea. It's a great way to start the egg bag. Would you reach inside and pull out the egg? Just the other day, I found an ad in the Sphinx for some unknown defunct magic company. Literally, wallet, pull your egg bag out of the wallet and start it that way. It was heartbreaking, Paul. But it's only th- that, that n- not necessarily the method, and that's... Oh, I think, I think, it, is, think, it, I think is. it is the same. Yeah, I think it's... Because just by the conditions that were discussed, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty much... Yeah. Well, that's good. You know, you're thinking in the right uh, arena. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the stuff we, we do in Magic on the Go and, you know, historical uh, historical stuff as well. Yeah. Fantastic. So if you love magic, check out Magic on the Go. If you don't like magic, it's probably not the site for you. <laughs> yeah. Bugger off. Watch um, Paul's show instead. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Valentine, it's been a, a pleasure as ever. Uh, Lovely talking to you, my yeah, friend. I miss- we did it. We did two hours. Yeah, I didn't you, think we would. Yeah, you was moaning about the time with me. Oh, I've only- and then, you know. Well, gets- you know, my hemorrhoids, man. I've got, I've got to keep an eye on it. I'm sitting on a donut as it is. Don't talk to me about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, miss having you here. Um, yeah. Well, I miss you. I miss you, man. And hopefully, I'll see you next year in LA. If you're going, you're going back to England for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, but I'll be back. Uh, just getting everything sorted, and then I get all my ducks in a row for uh, for pilot season, I guess. And uh, yeah, get, get it's going to happen. It's going to happen, and you know, things are it's kind of starting already. Actually, I've missed it again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> never mind. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, and. Uh, Thanks for being My on pleasure, the podcast, mate. and we'll see All you right. soon. Love to everybody. Take care. And just to everyone out there who's listening and watching and having a tough time, stiff up a lip. We can get through this. I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I really do. I'm positive about the next few months from everything I'm reading, and uh, um, I think we're going to come out of this stronger. And I, and I agree with Paul in that I think we're gonna. There's going to be a rush for live entertainment like we haven't seen in years. We already had a bit of it before covid people were really getting into live i think it's going to be uh, next level so be prepared and raise your prices don't be cheap start high don't be cheap. people are going to want to pay people are going to want to pay and the corporations are going to want to pay and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next fabulous thank you steve all right mate take it easy